Well, I'll be damned. This new Mandate of Heaven DLC looks like a step in the right direction. New units, new characters, new mechanics, new battlefield deployables, and, unlike the Eight Princes, its ties to the Three Kingdoms are a bit more... direct? Bravo, sirs! Bravo! It's not often that I applaud Creative Assembly, but in this instance, I must. My jests aside, I'm sure that while there's many out there who are nuanced in this period of history that are ecstatic for this chapter of the story, there are also plenty out there who haven't the slightest clue as to what the hell is going on. Or maybe some people might just need a refresher. So allow me to put on my scholar shoes for a second, and I'll try to bring you up to speed. The Mandate of Heaven chapter pack is about the Yellow Turban Rebellion. The actual rebellion, not the remnants of it like in the main campaign with the pre-order DLC they did. However, while the focus of the trailer is about the Yellow Turban Rebellion, the gameplay reveal also hints at several other major events that will come into play, including the corruption of the Imperial Court by the Ten Eunuchs, the Liang Province Rebellion, and the rise of Dong Zhuo. The best place to start for all of this is at the beginning. The Yellow Turban Rebellion was a peasant uprising tied directly to the Taoist religion that resulted from a few key issues going on in the Han Dynasty at the time. Around the year 150, northern China was hit by a rather disastrous famine and a series of floods, and the usually fertile and prosperous central and northern plains saw a large decline in population as people either died or fled southwards as refugees. Refugee crises are always difficult for any government to deal with due to the mass exodus of people, but in this particular instance it was also an economic crisis. You see, due to the increasingly available amounts of labor in regions of the south, Many of the local magistrates and landowners were quick to hire refugees and put them to work. However, out of desperation and due to large supply, refugee workers were not paid extremely well. This led to many of these officials making a great profit due to not only the low labor costs, but also by capitalizing on the agrarian crisis caused by the famine. Now the famine didn't last long and northern China was on the rebound just about 10 years later, but the major effects from this famine were pretty significant and they can be summed up kind of as follows. Number one, there was a growing dissent amongst the peasant population in these regions against the imperial government for how they suffered. Number two, local lords began amassing large personal treasures, which in turn later would allow them to recruit private armies. And the crises put these regions into a state of destabilization, which made it not only a hotbed for rebellions, but also the large bandit armies you see later in the Three Kingdoms period. In Chinese history, there exists a concept known as the Mandate of Heaven. The Mandate of Heaven is exactly how it sounds. It's a strong implication that the Divine Forces of Heaven directly favor the current Emperor and his dynasty. No one person assigns the Mandate of Heaven, and the Emperor cannot just insist he has the Mandate and it's true, either. Instead, the Mandate of Heaven is directly tied to public opinion. When the Empire is flourishing, the people are prospering, and the borders are safe, then it's unanimously agreed that the Emperor has the Mandate. As a result of this famine, many of the peasants adversely affected by it began to lose faith in the Han government, believing that the Emperor no longer possessed the Mandate of Heaven. However, it takes more than just that to start a rebellion. Taoism is a religion that originated in China before the Han Dynasty, but grew to prominence during it. It's primarily based on folk religions at the time, being a composite of many of them. It also places a great emphasis on the famous philosopher Lao Tzu, who was seen as a great prophet, and his teachings are the epicenter of the religion. As difficult times grew more common, Taoism became increasingly popular as a religion amongst the disaffected, as it offered a sense of spiritual relief without relying on the rigid hierarchical social structures required by Confucianism. It should go without saying that when you have two religious systems, both based around philosophers with differing beliefs and teachings, then conflict begins to brew. As Taoism grew in popularity during the end of the Han Dynasty, it was increasingly demonized by the Confucianist majority, becoming associated with taboos such as sorcery, secret societies, and conspiracies against the government. In addition to the famines and culture clash, the court of the Han Dynasty was growing increasingly corrupt. The ruling Emperor Ling, named Liu Hong, his grip on his court had been slipping since the beginning of his rule primarily due to the state of the court he inherited from his predecessor, Emperor Huan. A eunuch is a court attendant that has been castrated, primarily so there's no risk of the eunuch fathering bastard children with the Empress Dowager or the Empress Concubines. However, castration does not prevent eunuchs from having their own ambitions, vices, and motivations. As attendants that routinely hold the Emperor's ear and might even advise him, 
It is very easy for Unix to gain power in Imperial courts without actually holding any official power. In Emperor Huan's court, Unix became a dominant political force, which eventually resulted in public unrest from the educated in the year 166. Instead of evicting the corrupt units, Huan instead cracked down on the protesting gentry, an act that kind of cemented eunuch power in the imperial court that lasted into the reign of Emperor Ling. During Emperor Ling's rule, ten eunuchs, often referred to as the Ten Attendants, became figureheads of corruption. It should be noted that Ling became emperor when he was only twelve. In a sense, these eunuchs raised him to be a puppet for them, and Ling even referred to the most powerful of these units, Zhang Rong, as his adopted father. It wasn't a secret that it was the eunuchs who controlled the imperial court, even amongst the peasantry. So you have a large, disaffected population, being exploited for personal gain, who have found some harmony in a young religion that has been demonized by the government-sponsored way of thought, which is resulting from a corrupt imperial court where it's totally obvious the emperor isn't the actual guy calling the shots anymore. And all the while, the empire is continually being bereft by famines, floods, and bandits. It could be kind of easy to see why such a large population thought the Mandate of Heaven had been lost. Fast forward now to approximately the year 180, where three brothers are living and working in these disaffected regions as Taoist folk healers. The eldest brother is Zhang Jue, sometimes known as Zhang Jiao, depending on the reading of the character that's used to write his name. His younger brothers are Zhang Liang and Zhang Bao. The trio work very closely with the peasantry, healing illness with the spiritual powers derived through confession and absolution of sin. Zhang Jue himself was seen by the peasantry as a miracle worker, and he amassed a great deal of followers which in turn allowed him to start a spiritual movement. His sect of followers, growing by the day, wore yellow scarves around their head. It should be noted the significance of yellow as a color here, as it's something I often feel is overlooked when discussing the Yellow Turban Rebellion. They didn't wear yellow because it was fashionable or it looked nice. The color yellow during the Han Dynasty and also during many Chinese dynasties is greatly associated with Earth as it exists in the cycle of the five elements. Yellow was also the official color of the Han Dynasty, picked because it was believed Earth, as an element, existed in the center with the other cursory elements of fire, water, wood, and metal existing around it, representing the cardinal directions. Thus, yellow symbolized the absolute authority of the Han in the center of the world. The color yellow also has close ties to religion as it was associated with the heavens. Many emperors wore yellow robes as a symbol of divinity, a proclamation that the heavens were watching over them and awarded the emperor the mandate of heaven. Zhang Du, his brothers, and his followers all believed that the Mandate of Heaven was no longer in favor of the Han Dynasty. But the wearing of yellow was more than that. It was a bold proclamation that the people are the true successors of the Han Dynasty and will be the center of a new spiritual utopia. As things escalated during these tense times, the Zhang brothers and their followers began plotting a massive uprising against the Han Dynasty to usher in a new era of political, societal, and most importantly, spiritual reform. The rebellion was planned to occur in the middle of 184. The brothers had allies not only amongst the peasantry, but also the gentry, and including people inside of the imperial court. Also amongst their allies were several nomadic tribesmen, such as the Xiongnu, whose shamanistic religions melded together nicely with Zhang Jue's particular sect of Taoism. Unfortunately for the Zhang brothers, their rebellion was found out before it could actually occur, and the conspirators in the imperial court were executed. Thus, the rebellion had to be rushed and began earlier than expected. Sometime in February or March, Zhang Jue and about 350 to 400,000 followers began a large-scale revolt that spread quickly across northern China. The suddenness of the revolt, combined with the imperial court's mistaken belief that they quashed the rebellion before it could happen, actually quickly put the imperial army on the defensive, and the rebels won several early victories. Not all of the peasantry were loyal to Zhang Jue in his uprising. Despite the intended target of the revolt being imperial officials and magistrates, many of the immediate victims of the beginning riots and revolts were the peasants themselves many of which still had loyalty to the Han Dynasty. After being pushed back quickly, the Han Dynasty began recruiting conscripts for the Imperial Army. But in its haste to put down the rebellion, the Imperial government also allowed officials to muster private armies to stave off the rebellion. At the immediate time, it was a great solution to the problem, but also something that would prove disastrous in the end. Some very famous names are found amongst the many officials who raised banners against the Yellow Turbans. 
Interestingly, the three families of Sao, Sun, and Liu, who would go on to form the Three Kingdoms, all rose to prominence partly due to their service against the rebels. Liu Bei formed a volunteer army drafted from the peasantry who were adversely affected by the rebellion, and forged powerful important connections that would benefit him later in life. Sun Jian, who was at this time well known locally for fighting river pirates and bandits in the south, earned his first imperial appointment thanks in large part to his service to Imperial General Zhu Jun. Cao Cao was only a district captain in Luyang before the rebellion, a job that sort of like a police chief, but during the rebellion was appointed as captain of the cavalry, where he very effectively suppressed the rebellion in areas he was appointed to. Dong Zhuo was also heavily involved in fighting against the rebellion, however he was largely unsuccessful in his endeavors and it was not through the Yellow Turban Rebellion that he would gain power. Instead, the beacon of the Imperial Army during this time was a man named He Jin, who was brother-in-law of the Emperor. He Jin organized the campaign against the rebels and actually crushed the rebellion around one year after it began. Zhang Liang and Zhang Bao were both killed in battle, while Zhang Jue, in a true twist of ironic fashion, died from illness before he ever saw battle against Hu Jin's appointed general Huang Fusong. The Yellow Turban Rebellion, in official terms, was quelled in the year 185, but reality dictates that such a statement is just untrue. First and foremost, pockets of the rebels who had been militarized for a while now continue to exist throughout the empire. Many of them became groups of bandits, outlaws, pirates, and other heinous individuals. However, many rebel leaders earned quite a bit of experience during their time at war and would go on to be valuable assets in the service of the local warlords. Realistically, the Yellow Turban Rebellion lasted all the way until about the year 205, when most of the remnants had been either defeated or absorbed by various warlords. And the last bastion of rebel remnants, who were now fighting on the banners of Zhang Yang and the Black Mountain Bandits, who, despite never being a Yellow Turban himself, his army was made up of large numbers of ex-rebels in his banded army, surrendered to Cao Cao in the year 205. But just because the Yellow Turban Rebellion was put down, I hope you weren't expecting things to get better. The instability caused by the Yellow Turbans opened up a vacuum for other rebellions to occur, and they did so rapidly from north to south. Sun Jian, who had demonstrated great bravery under General Zhu Jun, saw a lot of action fighting various rebellions. In the year 187, Sun Jian was sent to aid General Zhang Wen in putting down a rebellion in the Liang province, where he worked alongside Dong Zhuo. The Liang province rebellion is a perfect example of how the Yellow Turban Rebellion resulted in instability despite being put down so quickly. The rebellion in Liang began when local officials allied with Qiang tribesmen in 184, the same year as the Yellow Turban Rebellion. However, due to the need to commit most Imperial forces to the Eastern Front against the Yellow Turbans, the Liang Rebellion went mostly unchecked for several years. By the time of 188, actions were finally being taken to put down the rebels, but by that point, the rebels were so deeply entrenched that it was practically impossible for the Han forces to quell them. The Han government fought a war of attrition against the rebels for a couple of years. It also didn't help that by this point, the imperial court had turned into a complete mess. Due to his success fighting against the rebels, He Jin gained a lot of power and formed his own faction within the court that was now directly at odds with the eunuchs. Emperor Ling also continued to foster the corrupt unit faction up until his death from illness in the year 189. Ling was succeeded by his 13-year-old son, Liu Bian, who was named Emperor Shao. He Jin was appointed as the regent to rule on the child's behalf, which struck a chord with the eunuchs and further increased hostility between the two camps. He Jin took advice from Yuan Shao that he should rally regional warlords to lead their armies to the capital and demand the execution of the corrupt eunuchs. He Jin took this advice and issued the summons. Amongst the lords that were called was Dong Zhuo, who was recalled from the Liang campaign, which put further strain on putting down that rebellion. However, when Dong Zhuo's forces showed up, and they were the first to arrive out of all the regional lords that He Jin summoned, things were not how he expected. He Jin was assassinated by the eunuchs just before Dong arrived. In the ensuing chaos, Yuan Shao led He Jin's retainers into the palace and massacred 2,000 attendants, including most of the eunuchs responsible. Something that he was actually warned not to do by Cao Cao, and we're gonna find out in a little bit why. When Dong arrived, the palace was in disarray and the last of the eunuchs were fleeing with Emperor Ling and his younger brother, Prince Liu Jie. Dong Zhuo hastily intercepted the eunuchs, finally putting an end to their reign of corruption and also rescuing the emperor in the process. 
Being the savior of the emperor put Dong into a very powerful position, mostly just through happenstance. Despite the fact that he was a rather ineffective commander, he was able to take command of the forces of Hu Jin, who were now leaderless, the forces of He Miao, and also the forces of Ding Yuan, all of which met their end during this little debacle. And he did this simply by being in the right place at the right time. This is how the infamous Lu Bu came to serve in the ranks of Dong Zhuo. Dong was able to use these bolstered forces to quickly restore order in the capital and also cement his power. Now, he was pretty open about his plans, and he told Yuan Shao flat out that he was planning to depose Emperor Shao and replace him with Liu Shi, and he wanted to let Yuan Shao in on the scheme. Yuan was greatly taken aback by such a notion, and Dong Zhuo dismissed him to bow high, but not before appointing him as administrator to said region in a half-hearted attempt to appease Yuan Shao. Dong Zhuo was made chancellor by Emperor Shao, who was then almost immediately deposed by Dong and replaced with Liu Xie, who became Emperor Xi'an. Since Xi'an was young, Dong ruled as a regent on his behalf. So naturally, due to all this commotion, the Liang campaign was called off. Soon Zhang returned home to Changsha, Liang province gained semi-autonomy under the guise of several rebel leaders being granted imperial offices, and Liang would remain autonomous until it was conquered by Cao Cao in the year 211. By the end of the year 189, the state of the empire was both solidified under a new ruler in the form of Dong Zhuo, but also in more shambles than it had ever been. Dong was detested by the gentry, who saw his squabbling and hunger for power as a threat not only to themselves, but also a threat to the security and stability of the nation. Dong was also exceptionally cruel and tyrannical, enforcing grueling tax rates, routinely satisfying himself with palace maidens, and breaking cultural taboos in court on a daily basis. In 190, Cao Cao, as part of a conspiracy, gained favor with Dong Zhuo with the intent to assassinate him. This was a conspiracy with several other officials at the time. This plot was discovered before it could happen, and Cao Cao fled Luoyang. In the novel Romance of the Three Kingdoms, this event takes the form of a very humorous scene where Cao Cao is caught right when he's about to kill Dong Zhuo with a dagger while Dong is asleep because Dong Zhuo wakes up and then Cao Cao tries to play it off that he was going to present the dagger to Dong as a gift the whole time, which Dong Zhuo actually believes. <laughs> Around the same time, Yuan Shao, who felt exceptionally slighted by Dong Zhuo still due to their interactions earlier, rose in rebellion against Dong and called a coalition of warlords to gather to expunge the traitor from the capital. The coalition was joined by a number of famous names, including both Cao Cao, Sun Jian, and in Romance of the Three Kingdoms, also Liu Bei. The coalition against Dong Zhuo began in the year 190, and the rest, well, the rest is history. The Yellow Turban Rebellion is one of the most significant events during the end of the Han Dynasty as it not only caused chaos and discord, but the attempts to unite the country against it backfired in the long run. The increased control of eunuchs and their rivalry with He Jin brought the imperial court to collapse. Allowing warlords to raise and maintain private armies ensured that a unified country could no longer exist, and the gaping holes of power left in its wake in the wake of the events around it led to outright civil war and the dissolution of one dynasty into three. I would also like to make a note that the Yellow Turbans were not the only Taoist sect of their time, there were several. One other notable Taoist sect was the Five Pecks of Rice, which were a comparatively more peaceful order that were also brought into war and conflict. It should also be noted that while some very staunch Confucianists of the time persecuted Taoist sects, there were also plenty who did not. As the Three Kingdoms period went on, Taoism became more accepted into the mainstream, and several famous individuals were actually practitioners of Taoism such as Zhuge Liang and Cao Pi. It's just yet another fascinating dynamic of this era that joins the pile of many answers to have when people ask me, Mitch, what exactly do you like about the Three Kingdoms period so much? I'm very much looking forward to what will be added to the game, especially the promise of new units, battlefield deployables, and the brief tease that we got of siege towers it looked like. I would love to one day make a lengthy video discussing such things and how they were used in the Three Kingdoms period and also how they appear in Romance of the Three Kingdoms. But the one thing I will say is this is definitely a step in the right direction. Unlike the Eight Princes, this is a chapter of history that the Three Kingdoms enthusiasts, like myself and others, wanted for a while now. In fact, it's something that we kind of anticipated the game to start with. It'll be a return to characters we love under a fresh set of paint and the chance to see through the eyes under new characters who might not always get the spotlight. For instance, 
It's rare that an adaptation of this period puts Emperor Ling at such a forefront as this DLC does. More often than not, he's kind of glossed over in adaptations, not because his rule is insignificant, but more that there's already so much to include that he sort of just gets cut for time. Speaking of getting cut for time, I feel like I've rambled long enough here. The new DLC is out in January at some point and we're getting like free updates too, so I guess we'll just have to wait and see how that turns out. But if I may be so bold as to cross my fingers once again and say maybe, just maybe, I won't end up disappointed.